Gaude amus omnes in domino, diem festum celebrantes, sub honore sanctorum omni. Welcome to The Way of the Fathers, a podcast sponsored by CatholicCulture.org. I'm your host, Mike Aquilina. This is the first of two episodes about St. John Chrysostom. He is perhaps history's most celebrated preacher of sermons. In the East, he is honored among the three holy hierarchs. In the West, he is known as the Eucharistic Doctor. He is honored for his ascetical life and his courage. He is remembered for his life of almost cinematic drama. We'll get to all of that in due time, but in today's episode, I want to discuss one way he's often misremembered and dishonored. I want to discuss his views on marriage and sexuality, and the urban legends that are perpetuated about them. Now, I'm not recommending that you do this, but if you run a Google search on the terms John Chrysostom and sex, you'll soon find a mess of conflicting statements. Part of the problem is with the saint's interpreters, and part of it is with his own voluminous writings. Some 700 sermons, 246 letters, plus biblical commentaries, moral discourses, and theological treatises. When a man publishes so many thousands of words, an industrious enemy can pull together enough strands to make a strong rope for his hanging. And on the subject of marriage, John made it easy for his enemies. Indeed, his paper trail is so ambiguous as to seem bipolar. On the one hand, when libertines want to caricature Christian teaching, they inevitably quote Chrysostom. One anti-Christian website condemns him as the arch-villain among the fathers of the Dark Age, pronouncing him guilty of an anti-sex, prudish, killjoy morality. As evidence, they produce a number of his more shocking quotes, like this one. There ought to be a wall inside this church to keep you apart. The women have learned the manners of the brothel, and the men are no better than maddened stallions. And that's something he said in the middle of the liturgy. The sexologist Havelock Ellis judged John to be more than a little repressed. And even so great an historian as Peter Brown found Chrysostom's vision of sexuality to be, quote, anxious and bleak. Yet on the other hand, John is also the father most invoked by those who wish to exalt the Christian vision of marriage. The Orthodox theologian Vigan Garoyan speaks of Chrysostom's virtually unique contribution to a positive Christian understanding of family life. According to Garoyan, the theological meaning Chrysostom attributes to marriage, procreation, and child-rearing is profound, richly Trinitarian and Christological. Garoyan goes on to quote St. John's famous description of lovemaking. How do they become one flesh, he asks, and then he answers his own question. As if she were gold receiving purest gold, the woman receives the man's seed with rich pleasure, and within her it is nourished, cherished, and refined. It is mingled with her own substance, and she then returns it as a child. Gold receiving gold. That doesn't strike me as anti-sex, prudish, killjoy morality. So how do we reconcile these two sides of Chrysostom? Do we dismiss him as a hypocrite? Do we write him off as a hyper-clericalist who held married people to a lower moral standard than monks? No. I believe both sets of quotations, the harangue and the poetry, make sense in the context of John's life. So let's take a closer look at that life. John was born in Syrian Antioch around 349 AD. His father was a high-ranking civil servant named Secundus. His mother's name was Anthusa. Shortly after the boy's birth, Secundus died, leaving Anthusa a widow at age 20. St. John, like any good son, informs us of the objective fact that his mother was quite beautiful and could have remarried if she wanted to. She chose, however, to follow St. Paul's counsel to the unmarried and the widows, to remain single, 1 Corinthians 7.8. It was relatively common in those days for Christian women to enroll themselves in the church's order of widows. 
the women as young as Anthusa were sometimes discouraged because of the hardships involved. Widows committed themselves to a life of prayer, continence, and service to the church. Anthusa's piety and sacrifice made a deep impression on young John. She set an example he would recall in his later preaching. John also had an aunt, Sabiniana, who followed the ascetical disciplines and served the Church of Antioch as a deaconess. Her contemporaries tell us that Sabiniana conversed intimately with God. Needless to say, John grew up in an unusual, almost monastic household. During his school years, it seemed that he was destined to be a civil servant like his father. But with graduation, his desires took a turn for the contemplative. It was around this time that John was baptized. There was a tendency among serious Christians in the 4th century to defer baptism until adulthood or late middle age. Then he and a friend from school decided to form what was called a brotherhood, a household where they could share a common life of voluntary poverty, prayer, and contemplation. The young men had gone far with their plans when John broke the news to his mother, and she hit the roof. Anthusa begged John not to make her a widow all over again. She pleaded, and he couldn't resist her pleading. So he agreed to pursue his life of renunciation at home. He adopted the uniform of monks, a coarse, sleeveless garment. He took up scripture study under a renowned master, and he applied himself in service to the Bishop of Antioch. At this time, among his fellows in the ascetical life was a young man named Theodore, who would eventually go on to become the celebrated theologian bishop of Mopsuestia. Somehow, after three years of living the disciplines at home, John managed to break free and join the solitaries in the wilderness nearby on Mount Silpias. There he apprenticed himself to an old hermit who taught him the ways of the mountain solitaries. John lived in a cave by himself. He slept hardly at all, and he went without protection from the extremes of heat and cold. For hours each day he read the scriptures until he had memorized entire books. His diet was wretched. Yet so zealous was he that he continued these austerities even after his health had obviously begun to decline. After two years, he could go on no longer. He needed medical care. So he returned, disappointed, to the city. It was either while John was on the mountain or sometime soon afterward that his companion Theodore began having second thoughts about the ascetic life. His folks needed him to run the family business, he explained. And there was a young woman beckoning, too. Her name was Hermione. In time, Theodore erased his name from the roles of the Brotherhood, and he went home. Chrysostom's response has come down to us with the title, Letter to Theodore After His Fall. We have it in two parts, two letters totaling 24,000 words. From end to end, it reads like the words of a furious man shaking his friend by the lapels. Would you have me speak of the domestic cares of a wife, children, and slaves? It is an evil thing to wed a very poor wife or a very rich one, for the former is injurious to the husband's means, the latter to his authority and independence. It is a grievous thing to have children, still more grievous not to have any. For in the latter case, marriage has been to no purpose. In the former, a bitter bondage has to be undergone. Is this then life, Theodore, when one's soul is so distracted in so many directions, when a man has to serve so many, to live for so many, and never for himself? The rhetoric heats up and boils over as John tries to show the transitory nature of bodily beauty and the grossness of its constituent parts. He writes, I know that you are now admiring the grace of Hermione, and you judge that there is nothing in the world to be compared to her comeliness. But the groundwork of this corporeal beauty is nothing else but phlegm, blood, rheum, bile, and the fluid of digested food. For by these things both eyes and cheeks and all the other features are supplied with moisture, so that if you consider what is stored up inside those beautiful eyes, and that straight nose, and the mouth and the cheeks, you will affirm the well-shaped body to be nothing else than a whited sepulchre. The parts within are full of so much uncleanness. John goes on to compare such illusory and passing beauty 
with the true and lasting beauty of the soul of a monk steeped in prayer. Needless to say, the earthly beauty comes up the loser. He is careful to acknowledge, though, that marriage is an honorable estate, citing Hebrews 13.4. But it cannot be honorable for Theodore. Marriage is right, you say, and I agree. Nevertheless, it is no longer possible for you to observe the right conditions of marriage. For if he who has been attached to a heavenly bridegroom deserts him and joins himself to a wife, the act is worse than adultery in proportion as God is greater than man. For these passages, John has been vilified by secularists, radical feminists, and hedonists. But I'd like to plead his case, or at least plead that his over-the-top statements need to be considered in context, in the context of the immediate situation and in the context of his life's work. John was, after all, operating in crisis mode. His friend had already gone back on a lifetime commitment, checked himself out of the Holy Brotherhood. Theodore was breaking a promise he had made to God. John recognized this as an emergency demanding forceful intervention. It was a time for tough love. Some men use brute force in such circumstances. John, however, was slight in body and frail in health. But he had no equal in rhetoric. So John used what he had at his disposal. He used his rhetoric the way some men might use their muscles. He marshaled his strength, and he used it to its utmost limits. And he did succeed in talking Theodore back from the family business and Hermione's charms. Back to the Brotherhood to resume his life of prayer. Theodore would go on to become one of the most influential theologians in antiquity. We should also recall that John probably had, at this point, only the remotest experience of normal family life, mom, dad, and the kids. Remember, his father had died when John was an infant, and his mother's household was practically monastic in character. From this extraordinary upbringing, John proceeded to an even greater remove as he joined the mountain solitaries on Mount Silpius. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that John's upbringing was warped or harmful, nor am I sneering at his formation by the hermits. I think both periods gave him the discipline he would need to withstand the hardships of his later life. But they were unusual circumstances, to say the least, and they hardly equipped him for a positive, or even, I would say, realistic view of domestic life. But that too would come with time. And that is why we must consider John's doctrine of marriage and family in the context of his whole life's work. John wrote his negative statements about marriage when he was young and inexperienced. As he entered the bustling life of the Church of Antioch, however, and as he emerged from relative isolation, he encountered many families, real families, ordinary families, Christian families. He shared their life. He heard their confessions, he counseled them, and he grew to appreciate marriage not as a mere concession to weakness or a second-class citizenship in the church, but as a distinct vocation from God and path to holiness. Even more than that, he came to see it as a powerful image of God in the world, a type of God, a sign of God, a sacrament of God. But again, that came only with time and experience. John's gifts were evident to his bishop. He advanced steadily in the ranks of the clergy. In 381, he was ordained a deacon and licensed to preach. It was then that he earned the nickname Chrysostom, Golden Mouth, as he drew enormous crowds to church. After five years as a deacon, he was ordained to the priesthood. Another several years passed before John preached the first of the sermons in which we find his mature teaching on marriage his homilies on 1 Corinthians. A few years later, he would return to the same themes in his homilies on Ephesians and Colossians and his sermons on vainglory. That first decade of his priesthood was a time of intense pastoral work in the second city of the empire. In a moving expression of his love, he told his congregation, I know no other life but you and the care of souls. And what did John learn from all that work with all those souls through all those years? 
Just listen and you'll notice a difference. He preached, There is nothing that so welds our life together as the love of a man and his wife. There is nothing in the world sweeter for a man than having children and a wife. And he's not just blowing smoke. In that first decade of priesthood, John had somehow come to the conclusion that Christian marriage was as much a divine vocation as Syrian monasticism, and that Christian perfection was, by God's grace, attainable in marriage. Our preacher laments to his people, Why, it is just this that makes me sigh, that you think that monks are the only persons properly concerned with decency and chastity. This notion has been the ruin of us all. In the strongest terms, he assures his congregation that their calling is nothing less than perfection. He says, If the Beatitudes were spoken only to solitaries, and the secular person cannot fulfill them, yet Jesus permitted marriage anyway, then all things have perished, and Christian virtue is boxed in. But that cannot be the case. And so he continues, If persons have been hindered by their marriage state, Let them know that marriage is not the hindrance, but rather their intentions, which made an ill use of marriage. What is it that caused John's apparent change of heart? Had he grown worldly, as pastors sometimes do, concerned as they are with budgets and leaky roofs? Was he bought off by lamb dinners served up by the pious ladies of the parish? No. We're told that he continued to live by all the monastic disciplines, including fairly rigorous fasting, that he always took his meager meals alone, and that they consisted of meager portions. No baklava, thank you. He was a tough cookie. I believe that John grew deeper in his appreciation for marriage as he grew in the work of Christian initiation, as he taught group after group of new Christians to appreciate the radical transformation that God was working in their lives through the divinizing sacraments. In a city like Antioch in the late 4th century, a pastor could prepare hundreds of adult converts every year. He would lead them to the mysteries, and he would tell them of the mysteries— In baptism, God would give them new eyes of faith, and John would teach them to open those eyes. John taught them to attend the liturgy and see themselves surrounded by angels. He taught them to look at their priests and see men whom God has raised to a heavenly ministry. This is what the church calls mystagogy, the doctrine of the mysteries, guidance in things hidden since the foundation of the world. The mystagogue guides the new Christian through the external material appearances to grasp the unseen reality that is interior, spiritual, hidden, and divine. When it's used as a technical term in theology, mystagogy describes the period of Christian initiation that takes place immediately after the first reception of the sacraments. In the ancient church, This often consisted of daily homilies throughout the octave of Easter, eight days of sermons that revealed doctrines that had till then been kept secret and hidden, the doctrine of the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, the doctrine of the deifying grace of baptism. The preacher would go step by step through the rites, describing the ritual words and gestures, and more importantly, explaining their divine meaning and action. John told his class of new Christians, What is performed here requires faith and the eyes of the soul. We are not merely to notice what is seen, but to go from this to imagine what cannot be seen. Such is the power of the eyes of faith. The eyes of the body can only see what falls under the sense of sight. But with the eyes of faith, it is just the reverse. They see nothing that is visible but they see what is invisible, just as if it lay before their eyes. For faith is the capacity to attend to the invisible as if it were visible. John spoke these words in his baptismal mystagogy, but he hardly confined this approach to his liturgical theology. A mystagogical quality pervades John's work. We see it in his homilies on the letter to the Hebrews. It is everywhere in his treatise on the priesthood, And, I contend, it is the principle that gives life to his mature doctrine of marriage. We could honestly and accurately describe it as a mystagogy of marriage. He wants us to move from the icon to the reality. 
Still, he insists that we must learn also to venerate the icon. Learn the power of the type so that you may learn the strength of the truth. It's important for us to realize that John's mature doctrine of marriage is almost unique in ancient Christianity. Many of his contemporaries looked upon marriage as an institution that was passing away as more and more Christians turned to celibacy. In Antioch in John's day, there were 3,000 consecrated virgins and widows in a city whose population was maybe 250,000. 3,000 celibate women. And that number does not include any of the celibate men in the brotherhoods or hermits who filled the nearby mountains. Catholic theologian John Cavadini wryly observes that this was hardly the golden age of the theology of marriage. Many of the fathers ignore marriage or treat it as a somewhat distasteful subject. The best thing John's contemporary Jerome could say about marriage was that it produced future celibates. Yet John, in his later years, glorified marriage. It pained him that Christian couples continued to practice the old pagan wedding customs, which tended toward the obscene. So shameful were the practices that few couples dared invite their parish priests to attend and give a blessing. The celebration consisted of several days of drinking and body singing. The situation roused our hero to a passionate exhortation. Is the wedding then a theater? No, it is a sacrament, a mystery, and a model of the church. They dance at pagan ceremonies, but at ours, silence and decorum should prevail, respect and modesty. Here, a great mystery is accomplished. For John, marriage is a sacrament, a mystery, a model of the church. This is the language of mystagogy. John is beginning to guide us through the mysteries. His mystagogy of marriage was unusual in his day, but it had deep biblical roots. John grounded his doctrine firmly in St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery, St. Paul says, is a profound one, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. St. Paul, then, has included marriage among the great mysteries of Christianity. But he is himself digging deep to do so, drawing from the first chapters of Genesis. Indeed, any preacher who memorized most of the scriptures, as John did, would notice that marriage is a dominant theme in both the Old and New Testaments. The Bible begins with the wedding of Adam and Eve and ends with the wedding, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And in between, God, speaking through the prophets, repeatedly invokes marriage as the preeminent symbol of his covenant. For John, marriage is an image of baptism, where the believer is wed to Christ, and it is an image of the Eucharist, which makes one flesh of the believer and Christ. He tells the new Christians, Keep the marriage robe in its integrity, that with it you may enter forever into this spiritual marriage. Just as in marriage between man and woman, the bridal feast is prolonged for seven days, see how we too extend for the same number of days your bridal feast, setting before you the table of the mysteries filled with good things beyond number. Marriage, moreover, is an icon of the Trinity. As John teaches us, the child is a bridge connecting mother to father, and so the three become one flesh. And here the bridge is formed from the substance of each. Just as the head and the rest of the body are one, so it is with the child. That is why the scripture does not say they shall be one flesh, but they shall be joined together into one flesh, namely the child. But suppose there is no child. Do they then remain two and not one? No. Their intercourse affects the joining of their bodies, and they are made one, just as when perfume is mixed with ointment. Well, at that point, John must have looked out at a congregation full of people fanning themselves and averting their eyes, because he was moved to cry out, Why are you blushing? Leave that to the heretics and pagans with their impure and immodest customs. For this reason, I want marriage to be thoroughly purified, to bring it back again to its proper nobility. You should not be ashamed of these things. 
If you are ashamed, then you condemn God who made marriage. So I shall tell you how marriage is a mystery of the church. John did not want us to blush at the mention of married love. But most of all, he wanted us to have no reason to blush. Among all the ancient mystagogues, John stands out for his unique emphasis on morals. He insists that the sacraments should leave their mark on everything we do in life. We don't check the mysteries at the door when we leave church every Sunday. The sacraments have consequences for every moment of every day. Through baptism and Eucharist, we become partakers of the divine nature. John would have us then live our marriages purely as Christ lives his. And John doesn't hesitate to speak plainly. He doesn't care if he makes parishioners squirm. I think it's fair to say that none of the fathers preached as frankly on sexual matters as John did. What did this mean practically? He repeatedly condemned contraception as unworthy of Christian marriage, and he even calls it preemptive murder. Why do you sow where the field is eager to destroy the fruit? Where there are medicines of sterility? Where there is murder before birth? Indeed, it is something worse than murder, and I do not know what to call it. For she does not kill what is formed, but prevents its formation. What then? Do you despise the gift of God and fight with his law? John saw birth control as a violation of the type, a desecration of the icon, a defiling of the sacrament. If marriage is a sacrament of God, then it should be a true communion and truly fruitful as God is. John also condemned adultery, domestic violence, sodomy, abortion, divorce, and other acts that are unworthy of the sacrament of Jesus Christ and his church, the sacrament of the Trinity on earth. I don't think marriage can get any better than John Chrysostom in his mature years made it out to be. For a married woman or man to read his homilies on Colossians or Ephesians is to be simultaneously humbled and exalted. Exalted because God has lifted us up so high. Humbled because we must confront our own sin, our own clinging to the mud of this earth. John learned to love marriage, and we should too. As a celibate, he lost nothing in the bargain. For if a celibate renounces something second-rate, that's not such a big deal. But if he renounces something so great as holy matrimony, a sign of the Trinity, in order to live with the Trinity even now as an angel in heaven, if he renounces the sign in order to possess the signified, then suddenly the value of celibacy increases by orders of magnitude. As John himself said, Whoever denigrates marriage also diminishes the glory of virginity. Whoever praises it makes virginity more admirable and resplendent. What appears good only in comparison with evil would not be particularly good. It is something better than what is admitted to be good that is the most excellent good. Learn the power of the type so that you may learn the strength of the truth. There's so much more to say about John, his thought, and the adventure of his life, and we'll get to as much of it as we can in the next episode. If you've enjoyed this one, please consider making a contribution for the continuation of our series. The Way of the Fathers is listener-funded, so we're dependent on the generosity of people like you. Please pay us a visit at catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio, and leave us a note if you love the Fathers. We pray for our benefactors every day. De quorum solemnitate gaudentangeli et collaudant fili. Way of the Fathers is just one of the podcasts produced by CatholicCulture.org. To hear more from the Church Fathers in their own words, check out Catholic Culture audiobooks, readings of Catholic classics, including the Fathers and St. John Henry Newman. You might also enjoy Criteria, 
the Catholic Film Podcast, devoted to works of high artistic caliber and Catholic interest. And for interviews on a wide range of topics in Catholic arts and culture, listen to the Catholic Culture Podcast.